Hello and welcome to the Comedy Slab. I'm Adrian Lacey, speaking to you from the southeast of England. And uh, I'm in a neglected part of the country where there's no infrastructure, people don't earn much, and I suppose there's a, an upside, which is the house prices are low. Oh, hang on, I've got your script, Shane. <laughs> Talking about the Midlands. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> That was a read on. Shane O'Connor, well, we come in, please. You should have said we only get electricity on a Friday as well. If <laughs> that would have been more accurate then. How are you anyway? How's the Midlands? Yeah, good. Yeah, very wet. Do you know, I, I just um, I just thinking today, there can't be much more left up there, can there now? With all the, have you been having the rain as well? We, we've got real... Not um, to the extent you have, I don't think, but some, yes. Flooding. I, I, it's, we've got real flooding issues and um, For us it's, terrible it's wind Quality, well. not quantity. Yeah, yeah. Well, now yeah. we all know about your terrible wind. That's n really not worth pursuing. And I, I managed to do the the gag for uh, my, my late father. Always used to uh, is that say, is that a wind gag? Oh, sorry. The, yeah, the one you know. He, uh, somebody came to. I think it was the postman, or somebody came to deliver a parcel or something yesterday. I said, "Oh, it's windy, isn't it?" He said, "Yeah." I said, "You know, it's so bad." I said, "I watched the chicken lay the same egg four times." <laughs> <laughs> The old ones are the best. He's never heard it. It was great. It was oh, the... wow. He can come back. That's, yeah, well, he'll have heard it next time, unless he's yeah. got poor recall. Anyway, yeah. um, on a downbeat uh, point, just before we get into putting our comedy on the slab, we're going to dissect uh, a, a Russian stand-up act, no less, a female Russian stand-up act. But before we get to Olga, for that is she... Um, Sadly, we've, uh, we've lost another comedy talent. Uh, news came through as we speak uh, just earlier today. Derek Folds. What, what do you most associate Derek Folds with? Well, it's an odd one, really, because I, I had an epiphany in the... When was, when was Yes Minister? The 1980s, was it? Before it became Yes Prime Minister. Yes, oh, yes. So uh, late you know, in between around that time. Where I yeah. finally realised that he was the guy that worked with... Basil Brush. Did it take and you I, ages to twig? Well, I think it's because there was a bit of a gap, wasn't it? Because he did that in the 70s and then he left that. And he was quite a youngish man then. He must have been in his late 20s, early 30s. And then mm. he was in Yes Minister. And I think a lot of actors do this. He, like, he, did, he did Basil Brush and Yes Minister. And then he was in Heartbeat as a much older man. And you don't always connect the dots, do you? Do you? I mean, you've ever done that with, with people? And you think, oh, yeah, that was him that was in that before. Oh, it can be quite slow to do that or or never connect the dots until perhaps someone like you points out where the dots are in the first place. But uh, I am old enough to remember him uh, profoundly, though I'd like to pretend otherwise, um, doing Basil Brush. So I'm in shock that it was for... Uh, the four years, 1969 to 73. Right. And he here's the thing. On this first day of recording Basil Brush, and I suppose um, you're going to say to younger listeners, Google it, I'm going to try and help them get up to speed. Basil Brush was a, well, he seemed real to us, uh, but um, there were rumours he was a puppet, but he was a very classy fox, wasn't he? Mm. Uh, and uh, I actually worked with people, people in my... Um, sound engineering days at uh, TV Centre and also working at TV Theatre, because that's where Basil Brush was made, at the theatre, where Wogan was made years later uh, in the 80s, the Wogan TV chat show. Um, uh, but it was news to me that the... Uh, and he always kept a low profile, the voice of Basil Brush. I can't even remember now. We could look it up, Google it, of course. But he, he stayed in character for the entire day of rehearsal, or as soon as he was operating the Basil Brush puppet, you had to address Basil as Basil. Yeah, he, you were he talking talk to him. To yeah. yeah. But then I found out that that's, that's pretty standard practice with a lot of uh, puppeteers. Yeah, I interviewed Sooty and Sweep. And, um, he says with a straight face. But Yeah. but um, And do you know what? You don't want to break the magic with those either. No. I mean, they came into, came into a radio studio, and it was with the, the young lad who took it over from... Um, Matthew Corbett took it over from his dad. No. Have I got that? Yeah, Matthew Corbett was then ill, and then he passed it on to a lad from Leicester. Right. Uh, whose name escapes me. Apologise if anybody who knows him is listening. Um, lovely fella. He, he was a magician, and uh, he took him over and still does look after uh, Sooty and Sweet. But mm. he was the same. It's like, you know, he wouldn't... He, he wouldn't uh, 
he wouldn't he wouldn't break that at all. It's mm. like even as soon as he walks in the room and suddenly the sweeper there with you, it, 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 they're real entities kind of thing. Yeah, sweeper was so naughty. <laughs> he was though. He was. He was just like. <laughs> I mean, he wanted to spray water, but you know what that likes in a radio studio? That's not on at all, is it? Not really. really. So, but, um, um, anyway, I, I, I did uh, tease that I was going to say that, um, Derek Fold's uh, quote uh, on the first day of recording Basil Brush, so he was this, the grown-up sidekick. He yeah. said, uh, uh, I've had 10 years as a straight actor. What are people going to think? So 10 years he'd been acting before even taking yeah. over... Um, um, Basil Brush. So there must always be that worry that you're going to ruin your credibility. You're never going to be employable in any other sphere after that. I read his biography, Derek Fold. Um, <laughs> you love your uh, biographies and autobiographies, don't you? Yeah. Well, I said it's actually it was an autobiography. I, but um, I say I read it, and my wife goes, "Well, you're not reading it really because they're audio." I love audio books. I love uh, as oh, I've you, said before. You listened it. Yeah, uh, and. I remember the first 10 minutes, I thought, oh, because he he was quite old by the time he came to record it. And I thought, oh, I don't think I could listen to this because I'd just finished listening to Brian Blessed reading his autobiography. <laughs> Brian Blessed? Yeah, which was like, can you was imagine he shouting it? cheese? <laughs> but <laughs> Brian Blessed! <laughs> I'm, uh, so I went up to this woman! Live! <laughs> so, um, uh, yeah, and I thought, oh, I'm not sure I'm going to get on with this. But, he, do you know what? I came away thinking, what a lovely, lovely man. And he only spoke ill of one person. And that was in you. His in, and it, <laughs> no, in his entire um, autobiography, he said, you know, I'm not here to be said, but I will make an exception in this person's case um, because he thought that he'd treated him really badly. And do you know who it was? Oh, give us a clue. Someone in showbiz, a star, yep. in quotes. Dancer. No, Someone still alive? Dancing. I think he is. Oh, that's a bit I mean, you should dubious. have said, if you didn't say it, you should have said, give us a clue. Oh, yeah, but is it Mr. Blair? Yeah. <gasps> Lionel Blair. He, well, he is very it, definitely still he, alive, isn't he? He was in Panto in Birmingham, and um, uh, and and he just, he, 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 there was something about rehearsal and and Lionel Blair says, "Well, you don't need a rehearsal; it'd be fine." And it wasn't fine, and he it really upset him. He said, "He said, I, you know, I, was, I thought I've never been treated like that by anybody, and mm. I, it really upset me." I thought, "What an unusual thing for such a nice." He came across such a nice guy to say mm. in his autobiography. Must have hurt him, mustn't it? Really, it but, must have um, made an, an impression. Yeah, but you you do. I came away. I walked away from that. I thoroughly recommend it if you like a good autobiography. It's a lovely, lovely book, and he's a he's a he was a terrific guy. I mean, it was it was one of my favourites of all time. Mm. Yeah, a sad loss. Um, and uh, he was eighty-two. No age, is it really? Well, there's no age you want to lose a talent like that, is there? I remember when so, I was a kid. You know, people say like if they live if you live two years past retirement age, like if a bloke got to sixty-seven, they're going, oh, "Well, he had a good innings." Yes. <laughs> It, it, oh, tell you what God. it is, it's age inflation. That's what we're suffering from. That's it, yeah. yeah. And oh, expectation. Anyway, yes, uh, we will fondly remember him. And, uh, of course, um, you know, the, the advantage of the acting profession, if you've done TV or radio or anywhere, you know, any form that's recorded, I suppose theatre's different um, unless it's recorded, but uh, you do actually leave something uh, pretty tangible behind and certainly some very fond memories as well. Mm. Mm. So, R.I.P. Derek Folds, and we must move on to the um, very much alive Olga Koch. That's as in Loch, similar spelling, uh, K-O-C-H instead of L-O-C-H, and she is Russian, although it's a little more complicated than that. And if you think she sounds, when we get to uh, our three audio clips, if you think she sounds American, then there, there's pretty good reasons for that. Um, actually, some perhaps more obvious than others. Um, I mean, she did go to the States for some time. That's the obvious bit. But also, less obviously, um, she was educated in Surrey, in leafy England, um, but actually at an American school. I didn't know there were American schools in Surrey, no, but I, I guess they're everywhere. No. No. But um, sometimes there are schools that spring up around um, sort of American air bases because we yeah. had I was going to if you'd have yeah. said Suffolk where, like where Mildenhall is and 
mm. all of those places, so, you know, big, big American contingent. Um, I'd have said, oh, yeah, but, yeah, I didn't, didn't, in Surrey. Well, there are worse places to live, eh? Oh, I'll say. <laughs> I thought you were going to list them. No. You don't no. want to offend your neighbours. No, just I've written joking. them down, though. <laughs> well, just think them. Think them okay. into the microphone. Okay, sorry. Right, so three audio clips to come. Uh, she's a stand-up act, but um, what is, uh, is there anything particularly unusual about it? Well, pretty unusual to be a Russian act working in Britain, I would say. I would struggle to mention any others, just as I would struggle to mention any other German stand-ups other than um, the delightful Venning Hain. Um, and uh, so she's cornered the market, I would say, pretty much in Britain in, uh, in terms of uh, Russian acts. Um, another unusual thing, I suppose, is it's a, it's an, a narrative stand-up, and she's telling. Well, yeah, we'll get to a bit later on. She's telling mostly her story, but that might be one of my slight gripes that it's not quite as straightforward as that, as you might learn um, if you haven't already heard um, this particular act, which is called Fight. Yes. Would you? Would you? Um, which, interestingly enough, is uh, Cockfight, isn't it? It was quite, quite. Oh, very good. Just very good. Read it. Yeah. Um, that's that's the tweet sorted. A, would you? Would you say she's Russian standard? It's a bit like saying that I'm Irish. Well, I suppose she's playing on it. Um, but you, you weren't raised in Ireland, where she was partially raised in Russia. Mm, I, I was born in the Crossfire Hurricane. Oh no, sorry, no, that's uh, <laughs> Rolling Stones. Um, oh. Yeah, maybe. I was maybe, born I don't with know. a plastic I... spoon in my mouth. Oh no, that's Roger Daltrey. Oh, yeah. He was raised on the White City Estate near the BBC Television Centre, as was with a plastic spoon in his with a pla- mouth. Quite literally, <laughs> quite literally, <laughs> mate. He should sing it like this. <laughs> 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 well, presumably, he was only born with it in his mouth. He'd taken it out at a later uh, date and put it on his nightstand. I'm sure um, his mum would have got done for child abuse if that happened these days. Yeah. Yeah, unless he was actually literally born with it in his mouth. It could have been a congenital congenital defect. Slapped him and said, who's put that plastic spoon in there and took it off him? (laughs) Anyway, moving on, you had another point to make. Well, was it single-use plastic as well? That's the other Uh, thing that worries me. Different different age, different age. I wouldn't judge by today's standards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, No, I just, just, yeah, I suppose if she was born in Russia, then I guess she's Russians. I I mean, I was really disappointed about that. I mean, never mind the content... And the and the, the the routine and all the rest of it, mm. I, I kind of I, I thought, oh, she's American, and that kind of uh, that disappointed me. I'm easily disappointed. Well, obviously, but you have no reason to be. I think I'm satisfied. She's sufficiently Russian to call herself Russian. Mm. Uh, much more. You so should than... see me with a kinder surprise, though. I'm. I'm <laughs> is that it? Toy wise. <laughs> Toy wise. <laughs> um, yeah, clearly a very high threshold of um, surprise. A uh, low threshold of disappointment. Yeah. Um, so, shall we have uh, audio clip number one? Um, she is uh, She's going to hit rewind here and tell us the story of uh, how she came to be, I guess. So let's have um, our first instalment of Olga Koch. From what I understand, my parents couldn't have been more different from each other. My father, Alfred, a devout communist, sang in the Young Communist Choir. You know the famous Lenin song? Imagine all the people (laughs) living under communist rule. My mother, Marina, on the other hand, was much more practical. She wrote for a communist newspaper for a whole year about the perils of consumerism, but only because she knew that at the end of that year, they'd let her go to Prague and she could buy herself a fur coat. (laughs) Alfred and Marina started hanging out as friends, sorry, as comrades. And she kept asking him to go on cigarette breaks, which really annoyed him, until one day she didn't ask him to go. And he realized that he loved her. Or it was nicotine withdrawal. (laughs) So they got married, and Marina got pregnant with my sister, making her a Russian woman with another Russian woman nesting inside her. And I I looked up a lot of the facts in that. Like, um, is it Alfred? Is it's Mm. it's true, isn't it? Their father is uh, who she says he is, and it's it's not made up for effect, is it? No, we find out later he um, he becomes quite important in the hierarchy of Russia. The new Russia. 
or even the oligarchy. Do you want? Um, mm. Do you want um, a headline? My headline. I do. I'm glad you prompted me because. I might not have realised how mon- much I wanted your headline. Summarising in a few <laughs> words uh, what you felt about it. Well, do you want to tell me what I think about it? Because the new thing is that we did from last week is <laughs> that not only do I tell you what I this think may about not it, last it's that before I tell you what I think about it, you tell me what you think I think about it. Yeah, but that's just what you think. Um, no. Well, here's the thing. Um, we must confess. No, we don't have to. But, well, regular listeners will know that we can see each other, you and I, on Skype. That's more for timing than anything else. Certainly not for beauty. And, and certainly not for entertainment. <laughs> that's, that's certainly true. And you appear to be giving a little more away there with a, what appeared to me to be a little smile uh, while that was playing out. Whereas you're usually you you're studiously impassive, I think would be it's the wind. phrase. I didn't well, know whether it's like nicotine or withdrawal. Yeah. <laughs> or is it a double bluff? You pretend to smile, therefore you hated every minute of it. Do you know what? I'm so confused. I don't know. You're confused. I, Am I now telling you what you think you th- thought of it or what I thought you think? I oh, God. <laughs> don't know. Whose idea was this feature? I'm going to say, I, no, I, I look, I did find myself earlier today um, asking myself, oh, is, what's he going to make of this? And my guess would be, here's what I'm going to go for. I think you find there's lots to admire, uh, maybe structure, technique, things that aren't necessarily that sexy, but you're not moved by the story. You don't find it particularly funny, but I could be way off. Okay. Uh, Well, my headline, this will just give you a clue to whether you're right or wrong. (laughs) My headline would be, cock up. Oh. (laughs) See what you did there. Okay. So, So... um yeah i think you're half right in as much as um i would have had a lot to admire if we hadn't heard it all before um in terms of technique and and you know uh various bits and and piece of treatments and the rest of it so you but don't I, mean the actual story of course because that is pretty unique to her and yeah her I've, family. i mean i have to say when i read the, i read the intro i came to it with a complete a complete blank mind like this You've always got a blank mind. Yes, he looks very blank there, listeners. Oh, that was so relaxing. Um, (laughs) That Botox is uh, wearing off. I think (laughs) it's my own fault, wasn't it? I did come to it with a with a complete clean slate and thinking, okay, right, I no preconceptions, um, no expectations one way or the other, and I read the blurb, Mm. which started off in 2014. Olga Cox's father got stopped by authorities on the Russian border, which resulted in the most surreal year of her family's life. And I thought, oh, okay, all right, Mm. I'm in, I'm Mm -hmm. in, deal the cards, I'm in, let's get going. Mm. And then I gave it away a bit, and then I heard her voice, and I have to say, her voice and her accent, and and this is, you know, what can the girl do? That's how she was brought up. But her voice and her accent just grated on me for the whole 27 minutes and kind of ruined it, really. If you can't get past the voice, it doesn't matter who it is or what they're saying. You're stuffed, aren't you? Uh, You're yeah, stuffed. That's a shame. Um, so I was kind of on the back foot to start with. Oh, and then it got worse. It didn't get any better from there, really, I think, is the is the thing. Um thing is, I didn't realise you were a quadruped until you said that about being on the back foot. On the back foot. <laughs> All these feet in here. Perhaps you're, a, do with you're a little horse. Did you, tell me what you think. When because you, you approached it like me, didn't you? Completely fresh, completely new. You had no idea. You'd not. You've not heard her work before or anything like that. So you were coming at as fresh. What What were your first impressions? Um. Whilst I didn't particularly, I, I wasn't fond. I'm not fond uh, of her voice. I didn't warm to it, but it didn't. Uh, it didn't grate on me in, in the way you're describing. I thought it was a breath of fresh air. I think it's a particular breath of fresh air because think what we've just done, the last two shows, mm. uh, Pete versus Life last week, so um, sitcom. Is that s- not Sky, but it's Aping Sky. Channel 4, is that right? Mm. Uh, mm. And before that, uh, Extras with Ricky Gervais. So both male-led TV shows. I thought, well, a bit of radio for a change. Um, female-led, but also, well, you've got the, the Russian element, so a bit of exoticism. Uh, and also, I was going to say, more pure 
stand up as opposed to um you know sitcom type structure mm. so maybe maybe there's a lesson there i don't know perhaps it's me or perhaps it shouldn't be a factor but uh, in the context of what we've been doing i was up for it I, I, and, and a clean slate for me and uh, uh for me um i would i would reverse your headline and say up koch <laughs> Thumbs up, cock. <laughs> Can we say that? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so, yeah. The, the accent didn't ruin it at all for you. Because I, I, I kind of had this, like I say, this letdown because because the they played so big on the Russian thing. Russian, 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 Russian. And, and then she comes and goes, hi, everybody. How are you doing? Yeah, but but think if it was 28 minutes of a very strong... <laughs> I'm not in tune with it. A uh, Russian accent, comrade, you know. Yeah. Would you not have found that a little bit hard on the ear? Don't know. Might have done. You're quite right. I don't know. In terms of in terms of freshness and um, uh, originality, mm. I just got echoes of Sarah Kendall. Well, I was hoping you'd say that. Oh, that's a good thing. Well, that is generally a good thing. I mean, I don't want to push that because I get told off for making it sound like you're having an affair with her. But people can backtrack in our vast back catalogue of uh, comedy slabs. Um, and, uh, you know, she's te Sarah Kendall was telling her life story. And like this, I haven't said yet, but it's a Radio 4 show available on BBC Sounds. As we speak, this particular one, Olga Koch, available for more than a year. So that's good news. Um, so... And or it could be a very long year, depending on which way you're looking at well, it. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, how long is it before we mention the fact this is an adaptation of her Edinburgh Festival show? Because you have a particular beef about those. I mean, it it just sticks out a mile, doesn't it? It's just... I. Do you know what? I'd like to see her... And I thought this at the end, and I thought, what, what's what's the what's the light with all this shade that I'm throwing on this? Because it didn't it didn't really work for me, and mm. I didn't enjoy it. And as we always say on the comedy slab, just because I didn't enjoy it, or just because Adrian didn't enjoy seeing that, that isn't a reason not to go and investigate it yourself. It's mm. not an assassination of her character or whoever it is we're talking about. So please don't write in in green pen and crayon <laughs> because we won't read them. Um, but. No, you know, throwing all that shade and then thinking, well, so what is the light? And I think the light for me would be, I would like to hear her working for somebody other than the BBC because it's got BBC radio stamped all over it because it's lazy commissioning. Let's go to the... Who's big at the Edinburgh Fringe? Oh, they did well. We'll pick them, give them, um, a, you know, a translation of their show, which means that we don't have to do any of the legwork. We're just basically sticking with the producer and whack it on the air put a few sound effects in, jobs are bon earners, Del Boy would say. So I'd like to see, you know, maybe somebody work with somebody else because that's it just sounded like Sarah Kendall, and that's what they did with Sarah Kendall, wasn't it? Yeah, but you love that. Can I just um, remind once. people... Or oh, tell you... Once to you two. Um, remind people or tell them for the first time, if they're brand new to the comedy slab, that uh, I do do some work for the BBC... Uh, I'm off the meter at the moment, so they're not actually paying me to defend them. But I would I say... Mean, hardly. Well, he turns up and he goes and reads the, the Guardian for 45 minutes <laughs> in the toilet. <laughs> it's not work, is it? But go on. Give, giving all my secrets away. So um, I said but to here's the thing. Said, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, you've got to cut them some slack because actually they don't have money to burn in radio. That, that is true across the board. Generally. <laughs> no, because they're all burning it across the way in telly, aren't they? That's well, why. Okay. Or, or okay. websites relatively, or online or things relatively. that they shouldn't be, or the Persian service or things they shouldn't be involved in. <laughs> okay, but park that thought. The reality yeah. is if you're a radio comedy producer, you might have, um, hopefully you have got the, the wildest ambitions to do great works and original works from the ground up but you simply haven't got the budget to do that with every show. So what I, I don't see what is so terrible about taking an Edinburgh Festival show. You see, again, I don't know whether I can agree with that, because they haven't got you the money to, to do, you to do anything agree with other most than things. that. They haven't got mm. the money to do anything but that, with that, but they've got the money to do 12 series of Claire in the Community. But they, they're hits. But they're not supposed to be in the business of hits, are they? They're not supposed to be in the business of rating. They're I supposed to be in the business no, that's of not true. 
of public but, service broadcasting and, and, and yeah, diversity public service, and all of these kind There isn't a producer on the earth who wants their show... Well, maybe Radio 3 producers, because that was the running gag in um, Dead Ringers. <laughs> I speak as a former Radio 3 announcer. We've just had the ratings through and they've gone down. Good. <laughs> 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 They've got ever more select. Um, but that aside, producers want their work to be heard. I mean, it's like, like you know, the, who ever heard of a novelist who didn't want to sell any books? Or So do something original with it, then. That's, 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 that's bolstering my argument more than anything. If you want well, it to be heard, not, then do look, something... I'm not making an argument against original material, but I'm saying, look, if you've got to make stretch the budget across the year then that is one of the devices. And you've got a ready-made show, and it's a hit. I don't see that as such a terrible thing to do. Well, I'll tell you, here's another thing as well that ruined it for me. I don't know whether it had an impact on you. was the audience. I mean, I don't know what they were smoking or drinking. Well, they were but, on site. I'll give them that. Oh, gee, they were on site. <laughs> they were on steroids. I don't know what they were on, Again, really, to be honest with this you. Is, it, is that such a terrible thing? She's got is. a responsive audience eating out of her hand. Yeah, I mean, Why? Because, because they're laughing at things. And you're thinking, I don't feel like I'm part of this anymore. Um, because yeah, but I don't you never really bought understand. into it. You never laughed at the beginning. No, I mean, I, I didn't understand what they were laughing at. You know, she did a joke about tampons, and they were actually screaming, the audience were. And I thought, just roll it in a bit, love, now. Just calm down as an audience, you know. Calm down, there was a, calm there was a, down. There was a lot of it where I thought, actually, I don't, I don't even know what you're laughing at now. You laughed at something. Can I um, give you uh, a theory? Mm. Which is uh, all mine and nobody else's, to quote, is that Monty Python? Um, I, can't, I can't prove it, and it doesn't quite ring true even to me, but I'll float it uh, to our listening public, which is, coming back to her Edinburgh Festival show, that was yeah. an hour long. This is, as you've said, 27, 28 minutes long. Um, I wonder if she's done the entire normal Edinburgh show in front of this crowd, which makes them that much warmer, which means there'll have to be lots, lots of edits, which means it, the the synchronicity between the where the audience are with her and where we as a radio audience are is slightly different because we haven't been with her for an hour i mean that she does a joke about um i'm on the most wanted list for your younger brother now i kind of got what the joke was but a very warm response to that almost it sounded to me like that for the the audience was a comedy callback something she'd referred to earlier that i felt had ended up on the editing room floor could yeah. be wrong, but that was that's one theory I was working on. We must get on to a second audio clip. Is that all right? We can pick this yeah, up yeah, afterwards. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I mean, just talking about the when they were laughing. Mm. Um, at one point, she said, and she was just a it was just a descriptive piece, and she said, and that's how oligarchs are made. Mm. And, and people were laughing at that. <laughs> it wasn't even funny. It's like it's it's a bit like. The noise the boiler makes, isn't it? Well, you, once you hear it, you can't unhear it kind of thing. And by the time I got sort of 15 minutes in, I'm, I'm thinking, what are they laughing at? Why? And I, I felt alienated by that because mm. I felt like I was in a room full of people. I listened on headphones, actually, and I always think it's more intimate when you listen on headphones, but I was, kind of felt like I was in a room full of people and everybody was, was absolutely wetting themselves mm. apart from me. And I, and I felt a really strong alienation because of that. That's um, Well, at least you had dry underpants. Yeah, I was the only one. So I, I Every cloud, eh? Else's. Every cloud. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you had to go one better. Right, moving <laughs> swiftly on, uh, as we park that thought, um, on to clip number two of three. And, well, she's, she's a, um, by my standards, by our standards, um, a young thing, I would say. Uh, she's a child of the 90s, uh, which, of course, was a very turbulent decade, to say the least, for Russia. And so in the second clip from Olga Koch, from her show, which is called Fight, uh, this is a little about the evolution of one Russia to another, and possibly to a, even a third. But now having done all this research and seen how clueless people were at the time, I really think that more than anything, it was caused by negligence. It was accidentally bad, like the Titanic. Not intentionally bad, like Avatar. And at this point, 
<laughs> Russia has transitioned from its late communist phase to its 90s gangster phase. And my father has transitioned from janitor to mayor to deputy PM. <laughs> but just like that, Alfred's political phase was over. And I know how he felt. I was unceremoniously dismissed from my position as student council vice president for what the tribunal referred to as indiscriminate bullying. <laughs> People ask me why I was so cruel in high school, but did you know that in Russian we don't even have a word for empathy? <laughs> I'm not kidding, I was 17 years old when I found out about the concept of empathy. <laughs> Can you imagine what that feels like for a person? <laughs> I couldn't. And a great gag again. Mm. Um, not as great as the audience reaction, um, admittedly. <laughs> but um, I, the other thing is her delivery as well. She has a tendency to do these kind of shouty thing mm. um, quite a lot, which, which, and I think she's got a difficult American accent because she's got one of those kind of scratchy West Coast accents, hasn't she? That well, I don't know. Kind of, it's American with a bit of Russian in. It's it's got like a kind of. That's in it. My wife really can't stand that. Oh, do you mean what, what they call the vocal fry? Yes. A dehydrated vocal yeah, cord. That, kind of, that you hear <laughs> yeah. on NPR all the while. That oh, kind she, of, she's, but... not the, she's not the worst offender on that. I no. thought you were going to say when she said uh, Russians have no word for empathy, did that remind you of a Blackadder line? I think it was either Rick Mail or Aid Edmondson. I can never remember. It was the series I worked on, Name Drop, Name Drop, as a sound technician. Blackadder goes forth, I believe. The brutality the German, of... The, the Germans have no word for fluffy. Yeah, the brutality that, of the Germans is well known. Yeah. Their operas last for several days and they have no word for fluffy. Yeah. But um, I have met Germans. I never learnt German, but um, apparently they do have a word for fluffy. But hey, um, we wouldn't want to ruin a decent gag. Not with the facts. No, that'd be awful. No, it? yeah, it would get in the way. Terrible. I mean, like I say, there's some really clever lines in there. And one of the one of the first lines that she said, um, she said, I'll be taking you to the early Soviet Union. She said, who love communism so much that they're prepared to be violent for it, through to the late Soviet Union, who love violence so much they're prepared to be <laughs> communist for it. And I thought... That oh, I thought by that stage it was like a couple of minutes in. I was going, you were oh in. okay, <laughs> oh okay, this is going to be clever. And mm. then, and then like you know the Lenin Lenin joke that you played in the first clip, and I kind of thought, oh, I was doing that when I was eight. You know, it was like, it yeah, was, it was a bit of a roller coaster writing wise, don't you think? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> what I picked up on there is she's got a terrible singing voice. But that was almost funny in its own right. <laughs> uh, and also where she chose to pitch it as well, quite low in her range. Imagine all the people. Um, anyway, uh, yes. Okay, but you've got, I don't know, I take the rough with the smooth. I, because I was bought into it, I didn't think, oh, that's terrible to do, do a joke that I'm sure I was doing at the age of eight. Um, it's kind of hats off to you. You managed to work it into a, to a routine and story of your family. Um, one, I, I mean, I, I struggle a bit to find too much fault with it, unlike your very good self. But if uh, there's a couple of things particularly that come to mind, let's hope I can hold on to both of them while I try and um, bullet point them. Um, one is I've lost one of them, so I'm going to go, going to, go to the other one from the one I was going to. Uh, which is that at one point she's, She's, uh, you know, she carries on with the narrative um, and there's a little low level sort of sound effecty thing and one or two actors acting out, albeit in Russian. So it makes sense in one sense that her voice is over them because I, yeah. I don't speak Russian. Most of the, um, probably the BBC audience uh, wouldn't either, one would uh, assume. But it never came, as we would say in uh, Techie Boys, full fader it never faded up enough for you to hear it properly and then for her to talk over it and to dip under it it was just it was almost at the level of a mistake like a breakthrough of something that shouldn't really be there someone right. left a fader open did you did that worry you at all well there's the whole issue of sound effects throughout the thing as well which was something that i was going to ask you about um uh, and you i mean i think you're probably a lot of people in the bbc speak russian but only the ones who've been to public school um but <laughs> You, you wouldn't let it lie. You just I wouldn't um, let it lie. There was like typewriter sound effects and things like that, in various parts. And I yeah. thought, oh, I wonder what you'll what you'll make of that. And I think to me, it's like that is the 
uh, product of a producer thinking, well, I'm I'm being paid for this, darling. I better put something in. <laughs> you know, I better I do something. All the, I've done is could, sit in the toilet for 45 minutes and read The Guardian in the stall I, next to Adrian. I could almost hear the cravat as you did that impersonation of the producer. <laughs> and the cigarette holder. So I said to Ronnie, Ronnie, darling. <laughs> um well, look, I might have to work with this fine producer, so I'm going to um, distance myself a little from your remarks. I did find myself wondering, which is the other side of the coin of what you're raising, were these effects used in the Edinburgh show originally? And it sounded to me like she'd recorded her show and the effects were added on afterwards, and so she couldn't react to them. Uh, okay. and, and the timing didn't quite work as a, as a consequence. Um, I might be totally off beam. That might not be how it happened, but that's how it sounded. Uh, it happened. So I would, I would query that. And I said, I've got a, another thing to mention. I have um, remembered it, which is I felt it wasn't so much her story as the story of her father and a bit of a mm. name drop about a man who, as we discussed, became deputy prime minister. Or we heard her say in a previous clip, uh, deputy PM of Russia. And then, then you, I mean, that took the edge off it for me because I thought, oh, really brave. A Russian woman comes over here. She's finding her feet uh, from nowhere. And I was painting this picture of someone who'd arrived with a plastic bag and a Heathrow, uh, you know, a a aircraft and built up her life from nothing. And actually, it's, um, I won't say a spoilt child, but she had definitely privileged. And, you know, to be fair to her, she's not claiming not to be. But she's telling her dad's story more than her right. own. And I kind of longed for her to, OK, move on. What's your take on it? I don't just want you to name drop your dad, although that is a fascinating story. But I kind of feel he can tell his own story if he wants to. Yeah, yeah. And I, I mean, and that wasn't told properly because I was left thinking, well, what happened in the end? I didn't really understand the story that I'd been told. In fact, I went back and played the end about three times mm. um, after the second because I thought, well, I'll get it the second time round, and then I still don't know what happened to her, to her dad. She didn't well, really. Well, he fell out of favour, didn't he? I mean, you know about. I'm sure you do, but Stalin used to airbrush out members of the KGB, famously from photos, because they were rubbed out to use a kind of mafioso expression. Yeah, I.e., she, killed. She didn't. She didn't like tell the story about what happened, did she? Really, in that. I mean, other than other than the. The general, as you say, that he that he fell out of favour. But where, so where did he get the next flight? What what happened? Well, she does tell that bit that he stole away in the night because his his gut feeling was couldn't know he'd booked a flight for the uh, for the day <laughs> after next or something. <laughs> he left his wife, didn't he? I thought, what he a did. hero! <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'd like to see you a film about that. I'd like one. to see you risking that. Yeah, um, I'd rather face the KGB, mate. Yeah, well, <laughs> far less might, brutal. You might. <laughs> <laughs> you might wake up tomorrow and find the pillow next to you is is empty. Yeah. Um, she's got she's got an idea from uh, Olga Koch's dad. Yeah. But um, well, well, the image that stayed with me because it was a very good image, but it comes from her dad again. So yeah, it's making my point again that you know where's her original material, her original tape. But he said he felt like um, I mean, quite sad, but that he was in in a garage with the electric garage door closing, and he had to decide very quickly. You know, am I going to stay here and die, mm. uh, or am I going to rush out under the garage door? And he actually went left, um, booked an, presumably an additional airline ticket. He's presumably not short of that, a few bob. That's what I'm saying. Presumably, we don't. She didn't tell the story about what. Well, what did he do? Well, because he worried that because he'd booked this ticket and they were on his case, the FSB, yeah. isn't it, the equivalent of the KGB? A replacement thereof, uh, which is where Putin comes from, the uh, president. Um, he worried that he'd given them too much time to get papers to arrest him. So mm. there was a certain symmetry to it because I don't want to tell the whole story. People should enjoy it, and well, enjoy but it may she not be the right way. Tell the whole story, did she? That's well, the hang point. on, That's we come we come back to the fact if my theory happened to be correct that she'd done the whole show it's the way it's been edited arguably oh, okay. uh, which is not easy and but that might make your point that well we shouldn't really be hearing edinburgh festival shows you, you want to hear more original material well yeah. you know i'm not going to argue against more original material i just think uh, look i don't go to the edinburgh festival i've, I've been once i arguably i should go much more no, well, no question i bloody feel it. like i have the amount i've heard from well it. but but i i think well i pay my license fee and for that i'm you know one of the many things i'm getting is 
is an audio version of an Edinburgh Festival show, and why not? Let's face it, though, mm. and this is, the, this is one of the problems with the way the BBC is set up, let's face it, it would be cheaper for you and I to go up there in a taxi <laughs> and and personally bribe the people whose show it is than all the people it's taken to, to bring that to air. And that's the point, is that, I don't know, I just, personally, I think it's lazy, and I think... It, I used to say this to people in the BBC when I worked there, and I'd say, like journalists, and I'd say, "That's just lazy. You've done like the guest that you've got is the mm. first name that came into your head that you know will pick up the phone and will come on, but isn't the best guest." To me, that is lazy, and it's the one criticism that really seems to get under their skin. Oh no, it's not lazy. It's not lazy. Say so it is lazy. There's nothing. That is the definition of lazy. If you open the Oxford English Dictionary and look up lazy, it's a picture of you phoning somebody who you just know that we've had on 25 times before, and you know they'll come on. That's lazy. That's not doing the extra. And, that, yeah. and I, do th- I just think it is lazy. I, I, but at I, least know. they've got the energy to open the dictionary. I can't even be bothered to look it up. Well, Google it. Why am I called Adrian Lazy? I wonder. Lazy. Right, third and final clip. So, here oh, we I, go. I like this one. <laughs> now, why do you want to introduce this one? <laughs> You're too really lazy kidding. to have listened to it in advance. But would you, would you concede, sorry, that they didn't tell the story? Wh- whatever the reason, whether it was bad editing, I, or it's like now I you was say, I, felt, I felt I got sufficient of the story, but now you mention it, I can see there are, uh, there are some gaps. I was sat there thinking, so how have you got an American accent? Well, I've told you, but yeah. Was, you didn't tell the, you had one job tell the story and you didn't yeah, tell she, the story but she, but she can't squeeze all of the hour or indeed all of the 20 years into 28 minutes she didn't even say that he went to germany i mean i had to look that up myself i'm, I'm like thinking okay. i'm doing my i'm doing their work from here well but you know anyway well, at least you're you can't be accused of being lazy i googled it yeah <laughs> That's your idea of hard work, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so third and final clip. Fingers, the red raw look at them. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Final clip. And your ears. Um, so, what I've called this clip is Olga Returns to Russia. So, um, let's go with that. I don't think I need to add an awful lot. You're bright people. You'll work it out from this clip. The one thing my parents can't do now is go back to Russia. But I sometimes go to visit family or for work. And when I do, I try my best to see new places. A couple years ago, I went to a city called Yekaterinburg, where they have the Museum of Democracy. (laughs) It's right across the street from the Museum of Irony. (laughs) The Museum of Democracy has something called the Freedom Room. The Freedom Room is a small room with a chair and a camera that's always on, and you sit down and you tell the camera what freedom means to you, and they project the videos on the walls of the museum. So if anybody asks you whether there's freedom in Russia, there is, it's confined to a small room under 24-hour surveillance. (laughs) So this museum traces back the history of democracy in Russia, which started and ended in the 90s. (laughs) And that means they have this big display on the privatization. I got so excited when I saw it. I read all the wall text and I looked at every photo. The display told the story of the five guys, except in this version, there were only four. Look, I know history is written by the victors, specifically Victor Hugo and Victor Garber, but... (laughs) That day, I found out that my father was deliberately cut out of Russian history. And that's as far as we kind of go with it, really. I don't think I'm spoiling anything by saying that. There is something deliciously ironic about uh, what I would assume, and probably uh, fair to assume, is a largely left-wing audience laughing at how... um, a crock communism is and yet still thinking it's great which is a bit weird but there you go well can i Um, just point out um before you get lots of uh emails from guardian readers there is a difference between being left of center and being a communist right yeah just as one is to another isn't it though well but well okay in which case you're a fascist is that what you want to be called by me why am i a a communist Well, because I can't make any distinction between you being to the right of centre, which I believe you to be, but you might want to dispute that, um, and being a fascist. I'm not actually calling you a fascist. I'm merely mirroring back your... No, no, uh, if you were mirroring back, you'd say I'd be on the road to being a fascist. 
which well, was okay, one of the worst but... Hope and Crosby films they ever made, in actual fact. <laughs> the Road to Be the Fascist. I've got some questions to ask you as oh, well. Oh, here we and go. I'm only uh, asking uh, you. Dear listener, he is pointing at me, so it's a pointed remark. I'm only asking you because not that I feel you should have the answers, and I will not judge you if you don't have the answers, but because you're the nearest thing to a friend that I've got. Who's, <laughs> oh, who's, I thought that was the end of the sentence. That's why I laughed. <laughs> I thought, oh, yeah, it is heaven actually. help you. Who's heard this? Oh. Um, what does... She says Gorbachev was Bay. What does that mean? Is that a kid's I'm assuming, I, I, I don't know, but I, it sounded like buff to me. Oh, okay. The, um, the reaction of the crowd, but I was, yeah. Please Got write a in. Laugh, didn't it? So it did. The audience. We're did. obviously too old. Um, what was the reference to the lower back tattoo? I do not regret. <laughs> what, do you know what that was? Oh, that was fantastic. Yeah, because I could picture that. Um, supposedly, a Gorbachev quote, which I'd never heard, uh, which was, uh, we. This is at the time of Reagan wanting to pursue Star Wars. Where you know history is repeating itself there with Republicans. Trump now is talking about. Um, you know, colonising space. We might not use that term. Um, but Gorbachev, uh, at the more liberal end, in a relative sense, of Russian leaders at that time, up to that point, he said, we don't want Star Wars, we want star peace. Yeah. Or we don't need st- Star Wars, etc. Uh, uh, so she has it... No, she, look, it's a little wink to the audience, Oh, she was it? saying she had She it had it tattoo. on her back tattoo, and then she oh, just okay. puts on a really sexy voice. That's another thing. That's why I'm suckered, because she could do sexy. It obviously hasn't worked for you, but... It doesn't... That, see, that doesn't, that doesn't emote with me at all. It doesn't cut it at all. I just I kind of judge... Rather than... I just judge people on what they're there to do. It's like, if they're fit, it doesn't make a difference. <laughs> if, if, do you know what I mean? I don't. I, I not, wish you, know, you. You clearly haven't got the kind of hormonal corruption I've got. No, but uh, good on you. But anyway, I, you're I'm a married man, so just as yet. well. I've, I've got, I've got oh, another okay. question. Oh, blimey! Still wagging his finger, dear listener. Did, did you? Do you? Know, did you know who Victor Hugo and Victor Garber were? Oh no, I was going to look up Victor Garber. I knew there was something I was trying to do. Victor Hugo, yes, I knew enough to know. Uh, you know I haven't read him, which is terrible. But I'm not widely read. But. Uh, he, he I, wrote Les Mis, didn't he? Uh, almost Victor certainly, Hugo. yes. I Victor Garber is a Canadian actor who starred in Godspell and Sweeney Todd. I mean, what well, kind of reference is that? Yeah, that is a bit subtle. She just needed another Victor, didn't she? And she yeah. couldn't have Victor Meldrew. I don't think that would have worked. No, because um, he, he didn't could, write... He didn't write history, did he? Victor? Yeah. Well, neither of them did, really. I but suppose, she needed. She look. If you think of the phrase, and do you know where the phrase comes? from? I thought it was George Orwell, but um, it's probably much further back than that. History is written by the victors. Mm. Yeah. Who said that? Was that him? I. I, I thought he said I that in homage to Catalonia about the, you know, the fallout from um, the failed uh, Spanish Revolution. Yeah. Anyway. She had to have victors plural because the quote was history is written by the victors. Yeah. So, um, but she got away with it. Uh, as you say, it was such a warm audience eating out of her hand. They weren't yeah. going to, you know, excuse me, miss, uh, who's Victor Garber? Yeah. Uh, there must be a better second victor she could have had. But hey, it still kind of worked. It just left me thinking, note to self, I must look up Victor Garber. Right. But you've done it for me because okay. I'm lazy and you're not. I, well, no, it's just uh, otherwise it becomes an itch I can't scratch kind of thing then, and and I uh, yeah there was there was another thing you, I I came I was my mind was thinking about things that I shouldn't have been there was another <laughs> there was another point where she said um, she was ta- I think she was talking about persecution or something like that and she said and my sister took her husband's last name and I thought oh so doesn't <laughs> that happen in Russia then well no she she'd set that up earlier hadn't she by saying she took her I don't know. Yeah, I, she didn't. I don't know in terms of marriage, but yes, that one got past me. But she do, she does do a gag, which I won't do, uh, about her, the the tradition of taking your father's name. But yes. hey, you and I took yeah. our father's name, so that's. But it's the way it's phrased. Yeah. Um. It must be time to uh, look at the scores on the doors, Miss Ford. I'm. I'm. I'm ever so sorry. I am. I really. Oh. I really did. Because. I mean, as a, as a concept, and as you sold it to me, and I thought, oh, okay, that is different. I didn't oversell um, it to you, though. I was careful, because I didn't... I, I couldn't remember it well enough, to be honest. Right. 
Okay. Um, yeah, because you'd heard a bit whilst washing up, didn't you? Yeah, so. you remember that bit. Yeah. yeah. Um, it. Well, it stuck out because I hadn't washed up since last October. That's right. That's why it took you so long and you'd heard so much. Just because you were in there for days. <laughs> it was the backlog. <laughs> Just you, fairy liquid and a packet of marigolds. That's all um, it takes. Uh, but enough about my kinky If life. only you bought the rubber gloves instead of the flowers, you'd have been a lot more successful. Burn, um, burn. So, yeah, I kind of... Mr. Derek. I feel bad in a way. Um, so you should. So you are bad. Down on it, but... Um, no, you don't need to. Although I think it's that old thing. You you hadn't bought in, so all, all the things I forgave, you couldn't forgive, and they became, as you say, the, the itch you had Irritants, to scratch. yeah. Mm. yeah. Um, anyway, sorry, who's, who's going first with the numbers? Oh, I'll go first. Um, well, I keep defaulting to this, but it's my way of saying uh, it's good quality that I enjoyed, but... Not perfect, and that's my score of three and a half. Um, I did review it in my head. You know, am I defaulting to it too much? Am I really thinking it through? Um, uh, and, uh, you know, could I give it three? Could I give it four? Three and a half seems right for it. Um, but, you know, I think very high quality. And listening back to I've enjoyed it listening back. Um, uh, yet again, I've enjoyed it anew. I mean, she's so skilled. Well, two things particularly. She's, she's absolutely got the timing off Pat. The way she rides that, I mean, this is what every professional comedian should do, but putting to, side, to one side what you feel about this particular audience being overhyped, but she's just surfing the waves of laughter and doing, the timing is beautiful. And also she's just fantastic at comedy callbacks. And also, I haven't included much, there was a little hint of it at the end there, but she can do poignancy and bring down the mood a bit. I imagine she would do that a bit more if we if we heard the entire Hours Act. Yeah. I, and, uh, Don't expect you're fight, you to agree. You're fighting an audience like that, aren't you, if you try to, if you try to do any kind of poignancy? Not necessarily, because um, even, well, you could argue that an, an audience that's, <laughs> that's eating out of her hand it needs a break from... Huge waves of laughter. You can't do. They co- were eating thing. out of a hand. They were, they were like slathering all over, <laughs> weren't they? That was the thing. And it's like, like a dog go, with a big lolling tongue. And then my father died. <laughs> it's like kind of listen to what she's saying before you laugh at it, and then you might kind of, um, you know, get more out of the whole thing, and everybody else might get more out of the whole thing. I, I never. I, I was in Las Vegas once, and I went to. Uh, we went to see the Blue Man Group. And um, there was a lady sat behind us who who was American, mm. um, and uh, I don't know if you ever seen. Have you ever seen the Blue Man Group on no, stage? No. You ever seen that? It's it's very clever musical. It's like a kind of cross between musical and mime. It's that. that oh, were they the of, ones that actually blued up? Yes. Yeah. Oh bald. no, I have seen them. them. Yeah. They used to advertise Intel co-processors, didn't they, I think? And whatever. They had a West End show at one point, about um, 10 years very, ago or something. Very yeah. clever. I mean, mm. very musically accomplished. But this lady, this American lady behind me in the theatre, sat all the way through. She sat there going to her husband, going, oh, he's going to pick that up now, honey. Oh, look, now he's put it on his head. Oh, look, now they're walking across the stage. And she, it was like having audio description on. Mm. Through that, the whole thing, she's just like telling us exactly what we could see, and it reminded me a bit of that. It was that that's that's the kind of relationship I ended up resenting the audience for. It's it's very again the last time I went to the cinema, um, and it, the reason it was the last time is because it was horrible. It's like people talking to each other and eating loudly and throwing things at each other. And I, thought, I can only what? apologise. Yes. <laughs> I thought, why am I? Why am I? I pay this money to come and do this, and I've never been mm. to the cinema since. It's that kind of thing, isn't it? Is the audience kind of just, I don't know, just uh, really, really ruined it for me uh, in a major way. Um, I'll put you out your misery. Shall I give you a number? Uh, um, I'm going to guess two. Oh, one. Uh, mm. One. I really, and that's not for her. I'd like to hear her in other stuff. I, I would be prepared to. I'm not sure I could get past the voice. Though, I don't know, but. Um, I would be prepared to give her a go in something else, but it was just Hackney production from the BBC. You know, let's take something from from uh, Edinburgh, what I now call Edinburgh Syndrome. Let's take <laughs> something from Edinburgh and just do the same thing again, but we'll do it on the radio and we'll record it and we'll put it out. 
It's um, like Stockholm Syndrome, except you as the listener are the hostage. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Can I just say, before I forget, for legal purposes, uh, it's a BBC Studios production. Yeah. You might have guessed that, and it is, as I said earlier, on BBC Sounds. Yeah. Um, so I won't dwell on it. I'll just It's, it's a one and a five for me. Uh, but that gives an overall total of uh, four and a half out of five for Olga Koch. Uh, four and a half out called. of five? That's very good. That's 90%. Oh, sorry, what? Do you want to revise that? <laughs> four and a half out of five? Yes. Never oh, think. Five, yeah, sorry. Out of ten. <laughs> I'd give it four and a half out of five if I was slightly merrier and perhaps <laughs> laughing along with the audience if even more. If you'd had a few more. <laughs> <laughs> I think you've had a few before doing your sums. The pumping in laughing gas from the OB truck, that's what I think's happening. Or <laughs> <laughs> oh, they've just got an exhaust pipe and the hose is running to it. Oh, I don't gosh, know. yeah. Um, yeah, uh, I'll put a link in as well. If you want to, as Adrian said, it's available for a whole year, so you haven't got a rush over there right now but um unless you're listening two years from now as we in speak. which case <laughs> don't you feel silly where have you been <laughs> anyway homework for next week yes please i have pen and paper poised all the P's. Um, f- for you to slaughter next week uh i might no, like no. it you never know you never know you never know well you gave us russian comedy <laughs> Uh, Russian stroke American comedy. I'm going to give you some Kiwi humour. And Ooh. I don't mean we're going to sit and laugh at a fruit. Well, hey, an old fruit. There's another joke there. Um, is it the flight of the concourse? Oh, my word. It is the flight of the concourse. Have you seen it? Uh, oh, no, no. I thought you were going to say, have I heard it? Of course, it started in uh, Radio 4 again, I think. Uh, they yeah, started. On. Um I think I have seen one or two... Um, yeah, I don't want to give too much away, but I'm very happy to uh, to put it on the slab. Okay. Well, um, the the product of the minds of Jermaine Clement and Brett McKenzie, uh, Flight of the Concord is the story of uh, two guys trying to make it in the music industry. Um, it's a fusion of music and comedy. We're looking at Series 1, Episode 8, and it's called Girlfriends. I did try and find the episode. I'll level with you now, I'll be honest. I did try and find the episode with the song called Sexy Time <laughs> in it. But Just up your street. Was that, it's was that... sexy, <laughs> it's sexy time. Is it sexy time? I can't remember now. But it's been well, a while. according to you. Um, but yeah, so, so uh, Series 1, Episode 8, Girlfriends, Flight of the Concords, is what we'll be slumming next week. Oakley dokely. Are we able to say, was it BBC4? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, super. Thank you for that. Um, it remains for me to say on anti social media, we are at Comedy Slab. We don't overtweet, it's quality, not quantity. So at Comedy Slab, it'd be lovely if you uh, followed us, um, not in one of those sort of haunting um, <laughs> ways that leads to court action, but, you know, in a Twittery pleasant type way uh and of course we are also i say of course but uh, i'm telling you uh, it doesn't necessarily follow but we are uh, we have a, a facebook page at comedy slab as well so it'd be great and if you um, gave that the thumbs up yeah don't follow us like with hands down Ooh. hands up fingers down in a kind of bum, um, bum, bum, who was bum, who was bum. who played nosferatu the vampire in the 19 uh, i confuse him with nostradamus silent movie i can't remember who that was but uh anyway right. yeah uh this is episode 77 of the comedy slab if you want to uh, oh, i think uh, you're fine it's, to this. Isn't it 78 i do this, even numbers oh it is oh, 78 yeah, yeah 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 you're right yeah uh 78 so if you want to hear the previous 77 don't forget you can go and catch us on uh, spreaker stitcher iHeartRadio, uh, spotify apple podcasts and all the usual great places uh that you can get your uh get your podcast we should be there amongst them and also the YouTube, as oh. Uncle Uncle um, Rob Bryden character, Uncle Bryn. Bryn. Uncle Bryn, and Gavin yeah. said, um, am I allowed to ask you very quickly, did you see the Gavin and Stacey Christmas episode? I don't I know, it's some it. time ago. Uh, okay. Um, I'll make a, make a note. Note to self, make him watch it for another future comedy slab. You walked into that trap, good and proper. I was keep, I was keep trying to choose it for myself, but I've... I, there's, there's other stuff that I think, oh, no, that should go in for another reason. So it never happens, really. Right. Well, I'm off to make a cup of tea, which, if you listen to the whole of the Olga Koch show, is something you would never trust her mother to do because she might not put a tea bag in 
in the mug. I'll just leave that hanging there. But I did learn that Menzies isn't just a chain of news agents at railway stations. That, again, out straight over my head. <laughs> I'm I'm off to go and get a back tattoo that says, <laughs> I don't get it. <laughs> 